Okay, um, I would like to introduce you to Prof. Jonathan Janssen, who is now making his entrance. Can we give him a round of applause, please? <laughs> so, Prof. Janssen, I actually heard from him the first time when I was actually, not that I travel much, but I was with Fritz Hahn, who was the first director here. And uh, Fritz and Barry Green and myself went to the ASAF in um, the Academy of Science in, in Paris, actually. And Fritz said to me, you know, Zenobia, you should really get to know Prof. Janssen. You will like him very much. But I must say I was very scared. Okay? <laughs> and so um, over the years I've got to know you. And I'm so grateful that you can be here um, with us today to commemorate this Human Rights Day and talk about the intersection of mathematics and human rights in a way that you seem fit. So Prof. Janssen is a, if you don't know him, he is a distinguished professor of education at the University of Stellenbosch. He's also the president of the Academy of Science of South Africa and a Knight Hennessy Fellow at Stanford University. He's written endless number of books. I mean, he pops these books out weekly. Um, but he started his career, so I'm not going to give the long list, but he started his career as a biology teacher in the Cape and holds a PhD from Stanford and other honorary doctorates from Edinburgh, Vermont, Cleveland State and the University of Cape Town. The books that he's written that has impressed me the most are Knowledge in the Blood, and I hope you brought my copy with you, um, The Decolonization of Knowledge, and Corrupted, a study of chronic dysfunction in South African universities. Like myself, I'm also a disruptor, so um, <laughs> for change. Um, he was also recently elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences membership, and he holds an A1 rating with the National Research Foundation. Can we please put our hands together to warmly welcome you, <laughs> Prof. Janssen, for your keynote talk. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Um, the, my family is waiting for me at Lloyd's here at Sunrise Circle because I promised them I wouldn't work on a public holiday, uh, <laughs> etc. So I'm here under protest, um, uh, uh, etc. But uh, in any event, the, uh, can I just make a suggestion um, uh, or correction to the kind introduction? By the way, never introduce somebody off the internet. Half of that stuff is already irrelevant, you know, but um, uh, let me just say the, I'm not a distinguished professor at Stellenbosch University. I need to correct that. My letter of appointment was written by an Afrikaans, uh, Tani, uh, in HR, and it says I am an extinguished <laughs> professor, you know, so um, <laughs> could you please be more accurate next time, you know, I'm, I'm extinguished. Um, anyway, uh, just down the road here, not too far away where I grew up, in fact, right next to the family home in the retreat, um, uh, is a school that got the worst results in mathematics uh, and accounting at the end of last year in the NSC exam, the National Senior Certificate. So, you know, because I've worked in all the nine provinces with schools, I felt it my duty to respond to the score to, to, to the crisis at, at the school. So I called the head of education uh, in the province and I said to him, Brent, it would be absolutely, absolutely uh, irresponsible if I didn't say to you that I'd like to help that school turn around, both the old school, but also especially in, uh, in the subjects where they struggled. He jumped out of his skin and said, yes, 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 can you start tomorrow? Um, so every morning I start at 7.30 at the school, and then at 1 o'clock I drive along the coastal road here all the way to Stadenbosch to <laughs> meet with my research teams and, and other kinds of things that I do uh, on campus. Um, the only difficulty is the mind and the body don't talk to each other anymore. 
So the mind wants to do what I did when I was 38, you know, uh, and uh, not 68. So it's, it's, it's exceptionally tiring, but enormously fulfilling. So let me tell you about mathematics. Obviously, I know nothing about math, right? Uh, in primary school, my mathematics marks were negative integers. <laughs> because in those days, if you guessed on a multiple choice question, they would, do you rem if you're old enough, you remember this, they would take away marks. So my marks in math were always like minus 16, minus 19. My goal was to get to zero, just to get to <laughs> zero on the number line, you know. Uh, so it was really, really tough. I just couldn't understand it. I couldn't, I just didn't get it. Like most kids, including these children, yeah, I tell you now, half of them don't have a clue what the teacher says when she says the square on the hypotenuse is equal to the sum of the squares on the other two sides. First of all, they don't tell you it's about a right angle triangle. Secondly, for years I thought the square was actual square. I didn't know it's the number two. And when they taught me math at UWC, which was one of my fellow subjects, you know, um, Gonan from the book Gonan, Archer and Slabber, uh, you know, they were just drone on and on and on, and I didn't know what they were saying. There was no meaning to the mathematics. And I'm going to suggest to you in a set of slides in a minute that one of the reasons so many of our children struggle with math is you don't know how to teach math. All of you here, right? I looked at some of the titles for the different talks here uh, happening the past few days. I said, fuck, what the hell is this? I mean, I even had a friend, Jan Persens, who the title of his dissertation was Ill-Posed Problems. Talk about ill-posed <laughs> in mathematics. So I think math is its own worst enemy, you know, and I'll show you why in a minute. Uh, 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 and I'm going to ask some of you to help me at the school, because there's no use of sitting there with very complex with abstract mathematics and you can't make that real in the lives of the children whom we are privileged to teach. It is therefore no accident that there is a direct correlation between your performance in mathematics and your racial classification under apartheid. I can show it to you. I just don't have that slide with me. In other words, if you're white, you do fairly well on average in mathematics. If you're Indian, you actually, depending on the year, would do better than the white kids. But mostly, slightly less than colored, than African kids would do the worst. Okay? Now, I don't believe in these categories, just in case you think uh, I do. I think it's a load of crap. We're all just human beings. But we have these, these things, as the sociologists tell you, if you define something as real, it is real in its consequences. And so, f for sure, people actually think they're white or colored or African or Indian. Regardless, because of the funding over a century, you can actually see the, the difference in mathematical uh, scores, performance, simply by looking at racial classification, which is weird, and yet not so weird. So I think the quotation is overused uh, for political reasons, but it has some real life consequences when then Minister of Native Affairs, later Prime Minister of South Africa, Hendrik Verwood says, I'm sure you've heard this till it comes out of your ears, you know, what's the use of teaching a black kid mathematics when it cannot use it in practice? You've heard this over and over again. I think it's overused, partly because I don't think math differentiation happened at the level of policy. I think it happened in the, le the level of practice, but that's another debate. So why do kids, and I struggled for a while to think about how, because I think it's an elegant subject, I think it's a beautiful subject, and unfortunately a lot of people think mathematics is about calculations in South Africa, uh, when it really should be about meaning, all right? Uh, but the way people teach it, of course, is as a set of things. Uh, so here's the question, and I'd like you to think about it, particularly those, uh, the people in this room, many of you are mathematicians. Think about what this means for the teaching of mathematics at any level, okay? Um, and, uh, and that might help us solve the problem that in this province, for example, this province leads the other eight in the number of conversions of students who've left mathematics to do a really dummy subject called mathematical literacy. Okay, why? Because they've come to believe that children can't do mathematics. 
right? So you have this huge number of math lit. I don't know if you've seen these math lit questions. It's hilarious, you know, at, at many levels. Is that Prof. Luisa there? Oh, my word. I, sh I should have, I should have. I should have prepared. Uh, <laughs> um, and so on. So let me just go through uh, the slides. I know, Luisa, I've shared this with you in a small group in Stellenbosch recently. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Whoever's, if you can help me there, it would be really great. So as I said, you know, one of the reasons kids struggle is they, um, they don't teach math for meaning. And I've tried this all over the world, by the way. When I get to high, uh, school class, to high school, uh, primary school, the other day at Vine Rodi and Claremont, nobody can get this simple question right, okay? So this is where you look me in the eye. You don't try and dodge me, okay? Because when I come with a mic, <laughs> my goal is not to make you feel stupid. My goal is to make you feel the way kids feel when people <laughs> come to them with these questions. Have we met before, sir? No, so here is a question that I ask all kids and nobody's got it right yet. A man, South African society, so I have to honor patriarchy, a man has six goats and four sheep. How many pigs does he have? <laughs> Coming back to you in a second. Just think about, don't rush to the answer. There's a lot of people here who are gonna think less of you. Did you hear the question, ma'am? Okay, answer. Not enough information about pigs. I can see you avoiding eye contact. <laughs> no idea. You can't say no idea when this is such a fundamental, elementary mathematical problem. I, I, at the Free State, I used to teach all first year students in a compulsory curriculum. And when I came to them with the mic, they would. They would Panic. And I remember this one kid, she didn't know Afrikaans is my second language, so when I came to her, she started to pray, and she said in Afrikaans, Ach, Yere, dear Lord, mag hierdie plaag net verby gaan. <laughs> Let this plague pass over me. Six goats, five sheep, how many pigs? You cannot say I'm Muslim at this point. <laughs> so... I don't know. How, how can you not know? Aren't you a PhD in mathematics? No. Oh my God. We're going to struggle. <laughs> Sir, you look like a man of wisdom. <laughs> Great wisdom. But I, I don't know. I just think that I, I can. I am about to slit my wrist. All of you have told me you don't know the answer. How do you expect the kids in grade three to know the answer when you don't? Back to you, sir. Well, they can guess. I don't want them to guess. I want you to tell me the right answer. The right answer is, I don't know. And why don't you know? Because you did not tell me. What did I not tell you? I don't know. Sir, this is not a philosophy class. This is a mathematics class. Things are finite. They are real. Oh, my God. I honestly thought this would take two, 10 seconds. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sir, you look like a professor of mathematics. <laughs> Please help me. Maybe we pose the problem again. <laughs> <laughs> Five goats, six sheep, how many pigs? I don't know. I don't know. Why don't you know? Where do I see them? Oh, you need to see the pigs. <laughs> Oh, my Lord, this, I, I honestly thought this is, a, 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 you told me, is, am I in the wrong, is this mathematicians? <laughs> Zero peaks. Oh, shit. 
So let me do this slowly. Is one a value? One. Yes, it's a value. Wonderful. Is two a value? Yes. Great. Is minus one a value? Yes. So, is zero a value? Yes, it's a value. And what was your answer? It was zero. The value is zero? Yes. <laughs> you laughed outrageously at my lame jokes earlier. It's unknown. What is unknown? How many pigs? And how do you get to, you know, I don't know if you, about you guys, when I was in primary school, the teachers used to have, I, I thought it was the most wonderful invention. The teachers would sort of say, da, 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 write, da, you know, do a column on the right hand side. And what must you do in that empty space, ma'am? Write numbers. <laughs> With an X. What must you do in that empty space? Next to the mathematical problem on the left hand side? Your calculations, that's where you show your reasoning. Yes, that's <laughs> <my> <laughs> show your reasoning. Kirsten next to me told me. <laughs> you know, with all the problems we have in higher education with plagiarism and, and chat GPT and the integrity of assessments, this you volunteered that information. <laughs> I don't know. I'm giving up there. I have to go to my friend. This is a fellow uh, uh, fighter with me to improve schools. Chris and I work on schools. I have about six school projects around. And Chris, I've asked him to help me, and he's a very wise man. Chris, I need to get on with this lecture. Could you please just tell me what the answer is? Need to repose the problem. Uh, Nine cows, seven leopards, how many pigs? It doesn't matter what those numbers are. What is the second one? Seven? I don't know, ba baboons. How many pigs? No pigs. I, we just established that zero is a value, and so therefore saying no pigs is not helpful. Zero. How do you know it's zero? There are no pigs listed here. Does that mean there's zero pigs? In that context, yes, of the problem. Did I tell you how many cows there are? Yep. Did I tell you how many baboons there are? Seven. Right? Did I tell you how many pigs there are? No. Therefore, the answer is? No pigs, zero. But zero is a value. <laughs> Don't laugh. <laughs> I have to get on. So when you go to a South African child, they'll do the following without thinking. They would say seven times three, depending on what the numbers are for the other, for the non-pigs, etc., etc. And then I have to tell them something that my granddaughter, sorry, this is true, learnt in grade R, which is you cannot add or subtract unlike terms. Number one, I thought you knew this from grades R. Secondly, zero is a value, and so you cannot say zero pigs simply because I didn't mention there could be 100 pigs, there could be 20 pigs. We don't know. Now put that in mathematical terms. He's the mathematician. <laughs> undefined. <laughs> un un undefined. What is undefined? Uh, it's a mathematical object that. Uh, <laughs> why are you putting me on the spot? <laughs> why are you putting you on the spot? Because you're a white dude and I, you know, have had it with these black people. <laughs> okay, so I, I would say um, zero. With, no, no, hang on, hang on. <laughs> with, with, with uncertainty, because uh, I've never seen a farmer farm with pigs, goats, and sheep from data uh, in Pumalanga. And so I could write in my argument, I have, in all the farms I visit, never seen an example in South Africa where a farmer does this. And so I, I would guess zero. <laughs> <laughs> Holy shit. This is not an anthropology class. This is a mathematics class, you know. <laughs> I have never seen a farmer. Oh, my God. <laughs> and so even for somebody like me who knows no mathematics, the very simple idea 
that four times three cannot possibly be the same as three times four, you know, uh, is, is something that should be clear. But the reason it isn't clear, the reason somebody cannot say as simply as this that x in mathematical terms is unknown, not zero, that's a value, that x is unknown is because the way in which we teach mathematics is as procedure. We don't teach mathematics for understanding and that is why the kids when they go to trigonometry or they do Euclidean geometry, they have no clue what's going on because they are taught mathematics as procedure. And by the way, let me just say this. I've just finished a, a book, edit book, on how new knowledge is generated in 21 disciplines. I don't have math in there, unfortunately. So I've got engineering, I've got surgery, I've got epidemiology, I've got um, applied biochemistry, and so on and so forth. And I asked these 21 professors, 20, I, I wrote one for education, to tell me how new knowledge is generated within their particular field. Do you know how difficult that was? You know why? They could explain that to other people in process engineering. The moment you ask them to explain it to non-experts with a reasonable education, they didn't know how to do it. Why? Because they can't teach. That's what teaching is. Teaching is to take something that is complex and known to you within your discipline and make it accessible. That's the mark of an educated person. So many of you, I suspect, have been trained well in mathematics, but I doubt you've been educated well in mathematics. In other words, the ability to make complex things simple. That's the mark. There was a man that did this. He was at Louisa's University when he was the vice chancellor there. His name, he just died recently. His name was Harry Septel, a physician. When Harry went on the radio and explained to an auntie in Soweto, what bladder infection was. I used to get so excited, I wish I had one. He, that's how, <laughs> how well and how juicy, I mean, it, he could explain, he could step out of, you know, his role as a general practitioner, and he could make things simple. And that, in a nutshell, is why our children down the road and all over our country are struggling with this prince of subjects. I know people say it's physics. For me, the prince of subjects is actually mathematics and so on. And uh, they, they come from the, you are, even philosophy. No, I know, I know. You're being technical now, but, the, but remember even philosophy, okay? It's the roots of, of mathematical thinking. So I agree with all of that. But you know what I'm trying to do is make you feel good about yourselves after this calamity this morning. Okay. Um, so the loss of meaning. The press for coverage. So in our schools, there is one of the most ridiculous curriculum inventions called CAPS. It's called the, uh, what does it stand for? Curriculum and Assessment Policy Statement. You've got to, those of you who are not from South Africa, you've got to admire us for making up names, for acronyms. We're good. We're good. We don't know what it means, but we make them up, you know. So there was an OBE and there's a... Now what CAPS does is to squeeze everything. We used to have the opposite of CAPS, by the way. In 1994, uh, our government decided that teachers had endless knowledge. Kids were endlessly creative, so they created something called outcomes-based education, giving you broad outcomes to achieve, and how you got there was up to you. <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? And then the shit eat the fat. Okay? And just so you know, I wrote 10 reasons why this thing is going to fail. And ever since then, I've never been asked to do anything for my government. They ask my students, but don't be. Because they don't like the truth. It's an immature democracy, right? But as a teacher of the life sciences, I knew that many of our teachers wouldn't know how to go into the environment and teach plant sciences simply by looking at local uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, plants. They just don't know how to do that because they themselves, most of them, were poorly trained. In any event, so they did the opposite. This is what happens in curriculum history, by the way. It swings like a pendulum from openness to complete closeness. So now they tell teachers every second of the day what you must teach. Here's the problem. When you pack in a lot of content, 
you're not able to go back and revise. You're not able to go back and remind. You're not able to go back and, 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 and rebuild. And so you're just trying to finish the curriculum. And when coverage is a priority for a teacher, in mathematics, you are going to struggle. And that's one of the other reasons our children uh, don't do well. Then the experience of embarrassment. My great fear when I came back from studying overseas, uh, I came back with my two children. My boy was ready to go to grade one. And I had a big fear that every South African parent has is the day the following is going to happen. What's the following? I'm at the University of Devon Westfall before the merger. Phone call comes through. Professor Johnson, we'd like to see you at your, the school. Your son is in serious trouble. And I called my wife. I said, don't worry, it's not serious. I, know, I can imagine what this is going to be. So off I go to the school, and Mr. Paylard is sitting there looking very red, as he usually did, because he drank a lot. And <laughs> next to him sat the math teacher. So I said, now I know myself, look, I know most parents say this, but those of you who've met my children will know that what I'm about to say is true. My kids are perfect. <laughs> they don't smoke, they don't drink, and they believe that sex is for marriage. Don't look at me like that. It's not my beliefs, you know. <laughs> They're good kids because my wife raised them to be good kids. They come in here, they never sit down until they go to all of you and greet you. That's the way we raised them. So I knew it wasn't disciplinary problems, but I had a clue what was going to happen. I said, Mr. Paylard, uh, why did you drag me here this morning? And there my poor boy is sitting, you know, seven years old. He said, well, the teacher has been trying to get into his head that there are four steps to solving this problem in math. He insists on doing it in three steps. I said, fair enough. I said, fair enough. This really happened. I said, fair enough. Did he get the answer wrong? No, he got it right, but there's four steps. I said, fuck you. <laughs> no, I didn't say that. I mean, my heart sank. Because even though you got the right answer, she insisted that he go through this laboriously in her four steps. What does my child, what does any child learn in that process? Don't ever think for yourself. Don't ever think for yourself. And so when you ask a question, if any of you are around on Monday, we've got a holiday school at the school I've... Uh, I've been in, I'm working in. Come along. And I'll show you this. Sitting in a math class, grade 12, and you ask questions and nobody puts up there. Why? Because way back in grade 1 or before, somebody took the joy of learning mathematics out of them. Doesn't start in grade 10. There is a biography of mathematics. Just like I shared with you snippets of how I was taught mathematics. I'll come to that at the end again. So the fear of being embarrassed. And I deliberately did with you adults going around to make the point that even though you're adults, even though you know more mathematics than I will ever be able to acquire, you still feel uneasy when somebody comes. And, right? Um, uh, I should, and I know we've got ethics stuff at Stellenbosch University. So you suppose when you do something traumatic like this, you're supposed to give numbers of people you can call. So I'll give you numbers of people you can call, you know. <laughs> the fear of failure is related to that. But what happens if you don't know enough math to teach math? What happens if you don't know enough geography or history or, or biology to teach the subject? Then, of course, you're on thin ice. So we did, if any of you are interested, I'm happy to share the results anonymously, obviously. Right. So what we did two weeks ago, we did all the grade eights at the school. We gave them a math test to see what the gap might be between what they knew in mathematics, right, and what they were supposed to know in mathematics so that we can do appropriate remediation. 
Obviously, I have math expert teachers doing this for me, but I was watching. Then, Dr. Grantfield said something else. He did his PhD in math ed at Michigan State University, East Lansing. He then says to the kids, grade eight, put the name, uh, write the name of this primary school from which you came last year. I didn't know why I was doing that. And then I realized how brilliant that was. Well, first of all, most of the kids couldn't spell the name of the primary school where they had just spent seven years, which itself freaked me out. But secondly, we could see which primary schools were not teaching basic mathematics well enough. So what are we going to do starting next Wednesday? We're going to those schools and say, we're going to bring in people to help teach the teachers mathematics so that you don't pass the problem on to the high school in grade eight. So now there's build the math, et cetera. But if you don't know enough math, now South Africans believe in miracles. I blame Bishop Tutu. Because, you know, he called us a miracle nation. And in many ways we are in a political sphere. But if you don't know math, you can't do math. Where are you from, sir? Ah, uh, oh my word. Please, would you mind please standing up? Sorry, I, I got goosebumps when the brother said Cameroon. What, sir, just happened with a citizen of Cameroon? Um, <laughs> no idea. You said no before I got to you. Yes, I said I have no idea. <laughs> what just happened? with a citizen of Cameroon. I have no idea. <laughs> you know why I came to him, sir? He's supposed to know. <laughs> For those of you outside in, the math in mathematics, who only live in the world of mathematics, the equivalent of the Nobel Prize in the social sciences and humanities is something called the Holberg Prize. The first, oh, I must control my emotions here. The first African ever to win the Holberg Prize last week was a man called Akilembembe from Cameroon. Give them a round of this something. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. I called Akil immediately when I heard the news. I was so emotional. I said, I'm so proud of you, my brother. The first African to win the Holberg Prize. <laughs> yes, I think you interviewed him for the job. He said he, uh, he was interviewed for you at Wits University, etc., uh, etc. Et wow. Let me tell you, despite the shit we get up to here with our xenophobia, our universities look great because of Africans from other African countries. Thank you. You can applaud because it's true. And whether it's Kali Chabali in medical chemistry at UCT or Kiel, uh, we look good because of our neighbors, uh, etc. But if you don't know enough math, you can't, or anything, you can't teach the subject with confidence. But then there's also something called pedagogy, which I referred to or intimated. Uh, the ability to teach the subject. Now, many of us had mathematics teachers who were really good. Uh, my mathematics professors were very good with the first part, the content. But they had no idea how to break it down. How to break it down. And so learning how to teach uh, in... in is, is a very important part, obviously, of the reason for our inability to teach. Oh, let me just say this. Mathematics, in my view, is the only subject you cannot teach for the first time in high school. You can even teach accountancy for the first time at high school. In fact, I know accountants, like uh, the former head of FNB, this is where, he didn't do accountancy at school at all, but he became a chartered accountant. In other words, you don't, but mathematics, if the number concept isn't established in the early years, you can't simply make it up as you go. 
okay, because of the cumulative nature of mathematical and knowledge, uh, etc. And finally, what I call the enthusiasm gap. You know, when I came in here this morning, I, I felt really bad. I'm just, you know, there's no place for me to park. Now, any of you know, if you're going to have a keynote speaker, for fuck's sake, at least make sure there is a parking space. <laughs> there was no parking. Who was with me outside? Who, who, who was with me outside? Do you remember how I looked for parking? I had to park over there. I'm dead sure that my wheels are clamped. You know, and so you're going to have to pay the unclamping uh, fee. You know, I came in, but the real point I want to make is, as I looked at it, I said, I can see you mathematicians. Because you're all looking down. <laughs> yes, sir, but we're measuring the area of the, you know, tiles. Or whatever. If you are a teacher, whether it's in a school or a university, and you do not, from the depths of your being, exude an enthusiasm about the discipline, can I ask you to go and sell car insurance? You don't belong in a classroom. Because the whole idea of teaching physiology or mathematics or anything else is to do it in a way that the kids can sense the excitement of learning the discipline. But half of you, even in this room, you look as if you lost a relative. How on earth? How, how on earth do you expect the kids to get excited about mathematics when you look like a bereaved person? And the whole idea of teaching your subject is not only to know the content and to be experienced in its pedagogy, but to show that if you don't know my subject, your life is over. <laughs> I don't want to racialize things because this is South Africa and we racialize everything. But it is true. My last three universities were historically white universities. I work in faculties of education. And every year, until recently, I would do a... Um, a survey with first years. And I say to the first years, who are mainly white Afrikaans speaking women, I said, Why did you decide to become a teacher? Without fail, at Pretoria University, at Free State University, now at Stellenbosch University, they would say the same thing. The reason I decided to become a teacher is my grade 11 history teacher, is my grade 4 uh, numeracy. Uh, they would refer to a teacher whose very example was something they wanted to emulate. One of them even told me for years in primary school, I did not think that teachers used the toilet. That's, they don't produce waste products. They're at another level. Right? And I'm telling you now, when Gonan stood at the University of the Western Cape for an entire 50 minutes, with his back to his Math 1 class, in which I sat, and he spoke to himself for those 50 minutes. I said, why the fuck don't you go home? And did I not, if I had not stumbled across, I told Luiso this story and some of his colleagues, if I had not stumbled across a set of books called the Shaum series, in which they laid out in categories the different kinds of mathematical problems, for example, in calculus, I would not be here today. Because I could then teach myself. I didn't know what I was learning, but I knew how to calculate stuff per category. That's not learning, by the way. And so when you step in front of a class, whether it is doctoral students, or first-year students in mathematics, I beg you, show some signs of life. <laughs> I beg you, pretend you love your subject. Because if you don't, don't expect a teacher in a school to teach mathematics as if their lives 
depended on it. Now that I've depressed you, can I tell you a joke? The South Africans won't experience this as a joke because we're very serious. So at the school where I now work in the mornings, I was curious about why a teacher screeched from for 45 minutes in a grade nine class. I couldn't get it. And as she screeched, she thought she was teaching, kids would come in and kids would leave. Kids would come in with these music things on their ears and she did nothing, she just screeched. So the next morning, I thought, I've got to get back there. Maybe that she just didn't feel well or something. So I went back. Halfway through the class, a grade nine girl comes in. This is the class, by the way, ironically called life orientation. And she has a tracksuit top over her head. And because I'm a former teacher, my blood pressure went up. And I said, my girl, come here. So she came. And I said, take that thing off your head, man. So she took it off her head. But then she did the following. They had to carry me out of the class. I couldn't stop laughing. She put her face, I lie you not, in my face, like this. Now, you know, I'm quite an intimidating guy, big, black, overweight, you know. Uh, she put her face in my face like this. She took her index finger. and rubbed it under my chin. And she said to me, and why are we so unhappy today? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Pro. Can you give him a round of applause? Thank you so much. Um, you know, with, with Professor Janssen, you can never plan what he's gonna say, so um, yeah. We'll just leave it at that. But thank you so much for your insight and to giving people across the African continent an idea of schools in our section, in, in, in our country. Thank you so much. Um, and then um, thank you for your cooperation and listening. I'm going to hand you over to um, Rejoice now, who will just close this um, session. And perhaps if there are any questions, we can. You, would you like me to do it? Okay. Okay, are there any questions to, to, to Prof. Janssen or any comments, please? Now is your chance, otherwise he'll come up to you. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Janssen, for your uh, beautiful talk. Uh, in your work with the, uh, with the schools, um, is there a possibility for us to join you for mathematical enrichment? Thank you so much for asking that. The answer is an emphatic yes. We are putting the children, next week is vacation, uh, through the 3rd of April, 2nd of April. We are putting them through math, obviously, and so on. If you wanted to work with us, I would be supremely grateful, uh, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, not in, and work in two ways. One is obviously with the children, but also with the teachers. Do our, uh, for example, the, the grade 12 math lit teacher said to me the other day, and I was so proud of her. She stood up in the staff room and she said, I'm teaching math lit, but I have no idea how to teach a section called map work. Apparently this is about scalar measurements and, and so on and so forth. So for example, I need somebody to just sit with her and give her confidence in how to teach the basics of map work, you know, et cetera. The answer is yes. Thank you. And if you could just do the, take, uh, go through Synovia with my, I think you might have my email. Thanks so much. We've got some questions at the back. Thank you. Hi, Prof. Um, similar to Zurab, not so much a question, but a comment. You mentioned CAPS. Uh, my research falls under linguistics and education, and it's looking at... I'm not going to go into too much detail, but it's looking at what kind of teacher can most effectively use CAPS. And my next research project, I originally looked at uh, English as a first additional language. And my next research project, I'm, I'd like to look at the mathematics uh, CAPS statement or the CAPS document. Um, and I wonder if I could just find a minute 
later to get your take on how that might contribute to the teachers being better equipped, shall we say. Yeah, I love what you do. Um, uh, what I will do again via Zenobia, one of my master's students, probably one of the brightest I've had in a while, she just did a study in which she wanted to know how does she actually teach uh, natural sciences in primary school given the constrictions uh, of CAPS. So what she did is she put a video, you know, a play, a, a recorder in her classroom. And for 48 lessons, <laughs> she recorded not what CAPS says she must do, but what she did in response to CAPS uh, and its decision unconsciously. I'd be happy to share that dissertation. I would love that. That's brilliant data. Thank you. Great. Yes? Yes, sir. Thank you very much for this inspiring uh, presentation. Uh, I'm very happy. Actually, I want to really share my experience in terms of giving meaning. So when I was an 11th grade student, uh, my whole class demonstrated our, against our maths teacher because the whole uh, teaching was X and Y, and there was no meaning. So we demonstrated, and we went to the director. And then finally, they interpreted that as a political revolt to against the school. And really, that's very interesting. But the problem is, if the teacher himself uh, didn't uh, get the experience ahead of time, mm. what is he going to teach? Yep. That's the problem. Because they share, we, we are, uh, our teachers, actually. Mm -hmm. If the teacher himself didn't have the skill and the practicality, uh, he may not share. And some of our teachers, in fact, they were really dissecting uh, thoughts and showing us how have heartbeats uh, work, even if the thought has, is dead. But uh, for mathematics, that can be very difficult. So it depends on the experience of the teacher. Yeah, totally agree. Mm. Hi. Hello. Hi. Hi. I'm Italian and I live in Germany and uh, I see many, many similarities with what you said, with yeah. what you presented. In fact, you can remove South Africa from the title of your talk and that would apply probably mm. to many other places. Um, we know, or at least I I from my point of view, school is sadly an industry. Everything is standardized, yeah. everything is streamlined, even uh, kids' behavior uh, uh, has to follow protocols and so on. So my question is, how should school be? I mean, or how can we break through such a rigid you know, system yeah. and, and try to change things yeah. and avoid all these problems that you nicely highlighted here? Thank you. Great question. So I study uh, uh, universities, sometimes schools, universities as institutions. Uh, not as organizations. And as you know, when you're talking about institutions, you're talking about norms, values, uh, 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 beliefs that underpin a particular set of behaviors, right? And therefore, we mustn't fool ourselves to think that you can go into a school and overnight change that set of uh, commitments. However, here's the good news. In every country, including this one, not too far from here, I can take you to four or five schools where they have broken loose over years from that. One of the schools is across, uh, did you guys go to the Kenilworth? To the race course. Yeah, I, I thought you were here for mathematics, but uh, you know, <laughs> but let me tell you, right across, if you have time, particularly those visiting from other countries, right across from Kenilworth race course is a school called Cedar House that has completely broken all of the conventions from seating arrangements to you know, what is worth learning, et cetera. They have done that. Unfortunately, it's very, very difficult when in a normal public school, people are sort of locked into this idea of, for example, you must finish differential calculus by the third term or else, you know what I mean? And so everybody rushes with that logic to complete. But the good news, as I said, there are places just around here that have bucked the trend. Uh, sir, yes. <coughs> Mama Fupuanyinyi. So I'm Cameroonian, as you know, a professor of mathematics, as you guess. And uh, I must say that your talk really uh, speak to me. 
because uh, I've been involved in the design of the teachers training program in Cameroon, which has now been replicated to Rwanda. And um, when you find yourself in a place where you have to take action having severe impact on the life of many generations, you will become someone living with fear. And when you get to know how mathematics teachers are trained in from primary school, secondary school, and most importantly, how they are evaluated and how the curriculum is designed by those most of the time who have not been trained for, you live in fear. Mm. So um, there is a lot to do and maybe to rethink globally how mathematics should be taught in primary, secondary, and even at the university. But let us have uh, a hope. I have uh, two questions for you. The one is to ask you to elaborate a little bit more about your say that mathematics is its own enemy. The second question <coughs> is about what we usually mention as the definition of mathematics. If you want to stress a mathematician, ask him to give you a definition of mathematics <laughs> and to give a definition of mathematics to non-mathematician. You will be surprised. Usually, since <coughs> I'm the center president of Ems Cameroon, so usually having to give talk to non-mathematician about mathematics. And I say four things. One is that mathematics is human activity. Two, mathematics is part of our culture. Three, most importantly, mathematics is a toolbox containing solution to our day life problems. And finally, mathematics is a must for any ICT or technological development. So which of those four speaks to you? Thank you. Number three. Um, and I'll tell you why. <coughs> I'll tell you why. Uh, I've now spent enough time with people in, because of being in education, in mathematics education, to understand the marvel of, of mathematics, right? And, and, and I was introduced to the work of a Portuguese, uh, a Mozambican Portuguese, I think, uh, uh, a scholar, uh, uh, Gerdes or somebody, Paulo Gerdes, yeah. That, Gerdes, yeah, that, um, it's been a while now, but that convinced me about the cultural basis for mathematics. And the example my colleagues would often use, which makes so much sense to me, if you rounded up all of the kids who used to sell newspapers on the corners of the street, and you said to them, X squared, <laughs> is uh, uh, three or whatever the case might be, work out the value, you know. They wouldn't know what the hell you're talking about, okay? But if you ask that kid, particularly in the Cape, <laughs> where money is scarce <laughs> on the streets, right, whether he or she has ever given a motorist the wrong change after buying a newspaper, they never do. So there is something in the logic, in the culture, in the, uh, uh, the facility of mathematics that we've lost by formalizing it to such an extent that the kids can't see the connection to everyday life. And that's, what I love all four of your things. But you know, the, the fact for me that people, and again, remember I know nothing about mathematics as a formal discipline, but the fact for me that, that people think it's about crunching numbers, okay? I mean, machines can do that. You don't longer need to do that yourself, right? And I, for me, the joy of mathematics, those moments rare as they were, was when my uh, uh, odd teacher in grade standard, we used to call it standard seven, would go to the board and I could see this guy's face light up, you know, and uh, you guys will have to help me. There was a QED or something in what he signed off on on the math problem which I think in Latin meant, which was what we had tried to solve. I mean, I could see on this guy's face, this is big, okay? This is, but, but we don't teach 
with a mystery in mind. We don't teach with the elegance of mathematics in mind. We don't teach. We just sort of say, I've given you one problem, example of this problem. Do 10 for homework. How the hell is that mathematics learning? You know what I mean? So all the things you mentioned is absolutely correct. The elegance, the beauty, the mystery. Uh, we lose all of that when you have an exam-driven culture, okay, in which you are valued according to what you score out of 50 or whatever the case might be. All of that is... Be I, why wouldn't you my math teacher, man? You know. Jansen, so I, have, I have a question. You, yeah. you didn't mention the private sector. Yeah. Um, could you speak about their role? And if you could ask the private sector in South Africa for one thing, what would that be? So I happen to work with, over the years since 1991, with NGOs in South Africa in math and science. So even <coughs> those were the two the two biggies. So right now, as we speak, in Stienberg, which is around the corner here, and in Kayamandi, which is in Stellenbosch. <coughs> Why are you bending? <laughs> <laughs> this, you know, this is a very South African thing. You must make yourself small, you know, so. <laughs> <laughs> and at the, sorry, I'm giving you cultural elements of, the, of, our, of Cape Town. You know, this is the only slave town. <coughs> you won't know it from the curriculum. But uh, So you never, when you ask for the bread at the Robux, the traffic lights, you never ask for our bread. The person always says, I'll be break as a bread. You know, you make yourself small, you know, half a bread. So I give them a whole bread because I want to see the face, you know, anyway. So, um, <coughs> so yeah, yeah, so your question was about the private sector. So we work with the private sector. <coughs> Corner, yeah. We have people from the private sector who get NGOs who get money from the private sector. And I said to them, I want you to have a science lab. So we're raising money for that with Chris. And we want to have some math teachers in here, funded by the private sector, like Xenex, for example, which is one of our biggest watches them. And help teachers, first of all, gain the knowledge and the pedagogy to teach it. In other words, give money to experts, to mentors, to experienced teachers in order to teach mathematics. You want to know why the Free State province is tops in the country? When I was vice chancellor there and they asked, the premier asked me, what can you do? I said, this is a public university. We'll do everything. And the model we want in a public-private partnership is to take the top math and science teachers as they retire record, and put them into schools from Puri de Chaba in the Eastern Free State all the way to Bloemfontein South. What was the role of the private sector? The private sector was to make it possible for us to pay these teachers who are experts in their field to mentor other teachers. We don't have a tradition for interesting reasons historically like Japan where you go and sit in your fellow teacher's class and you give each other feedback. We don't have that because of 1976. But that's what the private sector can do. Don't try and teach them mathematics. Enable, fund good ideas that empower the teachers who then empower. Don't give the money, by the way, directly to the kids for mathematical toolboxes and so on because the kids will come and they will go. The teachers are going to be there for 25 years. Empower them to teach. I'm sure by now my wife is finding divorce papers, so I, I should uh, probably get on. Thank you very much, everyone. morning. Ladies and gentlemen, honorable guests, as we indicated when we start, Siakula is more than just an academic gathering. It's a unique platform where we also need to tell untold story, and we heard those stories this morning. So I just want to ask all of us to really give, uh, give a hand to all these learners who share their vision 
And who knows, in the next two decades, those are the learners, those are the girls who will be standing here. So can we give them a round of applause, please? <laughs> Professor jo uh, Jonathan Jensen, we value your contribution to Siakula and your solidarity as we strive to advance mathematical science landscape in Africa.